Welcome to Instruction Discussion, our weekly look at the latest topics and trends in education affecting schools here on Long Island and schools around the world. Whether you're a teacher, parent, or student, listen for tips and strategies to help you navigate the educational landscape. There's a bell. It's time to start today's Instruction Discussion on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hello, I'm Kevin Boston Hill, and welcome to Instruction Discussion where each week we will examine a recent trend or development in education and its impact on Long Island. Talk to any successful person, and when they describe their template to success, they will undoubtedly include mentorship as one of those elements. They may also mention that they had a variety of mentors to reflect the different phases of development they went through. When you think of mentoring, you may conjure the image of the Mr. Miyagi type guiding and influencing young Daniel or something similar to that. While this image may be accurate, mentoring is not limited to the old sage young student relationship. Mentoring can take many forms, whether in person or virtual, one-on-one or in a group, once a week or once a quarter, and even younger person to older person. To help us understand the importance of mentorship, no matter the form and no matter whether you are a student in school, an employee on the job, or looking to build your brand, today we welcome author, host of the podcast On Leadership with Scott Miller, and Franklin Covey Senior Advisor on Thought Leadership, Scott Jeffrey Miller. Welcome to Instruction Discussion on 90.3 WHPC. Kevin, honored to be here. Thank you for the spotlight and the platform. Looking forward to talking about all things mentoring with you. This is a topic I really enjoy talking about, not just for my, because I know I I benefited greatly in my career from mentors, and I try to serve to be a mentor to a lot of different people that I come across as well. So I think this will be a really good topic, no matter what age we're we're talking about. Well, I would agree. I think mentor is pretty much age agnostic now, right? You're seeing, as you mentioned in your opening, a, a large swing towards younger generation mentoring the older generation. Some call it reverse mentoring, but I don't think it's reverse mentoring. I think it's called mentoring, right? Because if you've got a skill, an insight, something to share with someone else, it's called mentoring. I think your new book, Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds. To me, it reads like it's a collection of summaries of some of the interviews that you've actually conducted on your podcast. What prompted you to put them down in this type of format to put them in book form? To answer your question, as you mentioned earlier, I am privileged to host a podcast called On Leadership with Scott Miller. And like you, I have the privilege of interviewing influential thought leaders and celebrities and business titans and best-selling authors. And, you know, after five years of interviewing some of the biggest minds in the business, what I realized, Kevin, I'm guessing somewhat similar to you, is the good stuff usually is shared off air. Not intentionally, it's just, you know, In the beginning conversation or the debrief in the metaphorical green room, all these amazing insights are shared, whether it's Matthew McConaughey or General McChrystal or Seth Godin or Dan Pink or Liz Wiseman or Ursula Burns. I realized, oh, my gosh, I wish the audience could hear some of these great insights that this person is sharing. So with their permission, I wrote a book called Master Mentors, Volume 1, Volume 2, and Volume 3 comes out next year, where I take 30 people that I think have a especially transformative insight to share. And I wrote these books, very easy, very breezy. It's usually, but not always, the stuff that's off air. Again, with their permission, one chapter, one mentor, one insight. Kind of like the new chicken soup for the leadership soul. The books are very easy and breezy, 30 mentors, 30 chapters. And I pick people from all walks of life. The books are very episodic intentionally. One chapter might be about entrepreneurial leadership. The might, next one might be around self-confidence or customer service or being a transition figure. They're very episodic and they've been see- received well. I'm glad you mentioned that the uh, the self-confidence, because I want to get into that for a moment, because that was the one, uh, I think that was the chapter focuses on Sean Covey. Right. Many of our listeners, especially our youth, will probably recognize the name Sean Covey as the author of Seven, Seven Habits of the Highly Effective Teen, um, right. which was adapted, obviously, from his father's book, The uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which I'm sure everybody has read it in some form or another. Based on Sean's new book, the six most important decisions you will ever make, he kind of describes the difference between self-worth, self-esteem, 
and self-confidence. So can you share with us a little bit, what is that distinction? Because I think you actually pointed out, you laid it out really well in the book as far as what that distinction is between the, the three of them. Here was the insight. You're exactly right. Sean Covey wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens, the best-selling youth leadership book in history. And one day I was walking by Sean Covey's office. He and I were peers, both on the executive team at Franklin Covey, where I spent 25 years, 10 of which as the chief marketing officer. And one day I was complimenting Sean on one of the books he'd written. And we got into this conversation around self-confidence, self-esteem, and self-worth. Self-confidence, self-esteem, and self-worth. And there were two insights that I took away from it. The first of, we tend to use those terms, Kevin, very interchangeably, kind of like people use the word efficiency and effectiveness, mm-hmm. very similar. They're very different. One's not better than the other, but we use efficiency and effectiveness interchangeably. I think we use these terms, self-confidence, self-esteem, and self-worth interchangeably, and we shouldn't because they have very different meanings. Now, here's a second insight that Sean shared with me, and it's in the book, and that is self-confidence, self-esteem, and self-worth have all very different meanings. But here was the epiphany. Your self-worth is God-given. Now, if you're not a religious or spiritual person, then it's creator-given. Right. All of us have the same self-worth. It is inherent in each of us, whether you have been very successful, you've had a lot of setbacks, whether you've had one marriage, 10 marriages, or no marriages, whether you are a celebrity or you're on the rise in your business, or you're very content just living a life of, you know, harmony and quietness with your family. All of us have the same self-worth. It is creator given, whoever believe your creator, you believe your creator is. And for me, that was the watershed experience because I would often been comparing my self-worth to other people on the executive team. You can see in the story I write about mm-hmm. my comparison, even to Sean Covey. And once I realized that I could not impact my self-esteem, positive or sorry, self-worth, positive or negative. And, and Kevin, you can't impact my self-worth, positive or negative, because it's creative gift, creator given. Once you move self-worth aside, all of us have the same self-worth. Then, and only then, can you focus on your self-confidence and your self-esteem, because those can be risen and lowered by yourself and other people. And read the book to talk about the difference between self-esteem and self-confidence. But to me, that was a pit, an epiphany, not not wrestling with trying to impact my self-worth because it's it's the same as everyone else's and can't be increased or decreased, but to instead focus on my self-esteem and my self-confidence. And, and I think that's a really important distinction to make because especially when we start talking about young students and because they're always thinking, well, how do I compare with this other student next to me in school with grades and so forth? Well, you don't. Uh, because everybody has the the same self-worth, as you mentioned. So let's focus on something else now. We all do have this level playing field. Now we just have to figure out what are the areas that we're actually good at so that we can focus on those areas and not worry about what the person next to us is doing and so forth. Taking this notion a little bit further, I was just having a conversation. Well, there's a, a, a theory in, not even a theory, but there's something in science that says all is the conservation of energy, the law of the conservation of energy, that energy is neither created nor destroyed. It just kind of takes different forms. And this is kind of what we're talking about here. Like everybody, the self-worth is the same for everybody. You can't lower it or raise it. It's just there. And everybody is at the pretty much the same level, pretty much like the collective energy in the universe. It stays at that same level no matter what happens. It just changes the form and, and goes off into different areas, but it's all pretty much collectively the same. And I think that's what we're talking about here, that all of this, the self-worth is pretty much the same. The way we interpret it and the way we perceive it, that's where we start going off into the self-confidence and the self-esteem. Beautifully said. The chapter really is about now you recognize you can't impact your self-worth. Go focus on how to prevent others from diminishing your self-confidence or self-esteem or perhaps more frequently yourself. Exactly. Exactly. So let me ask you, in in your opinion, and I, I know you've interviewed literally hundreds of guests in over your, your career, um, probably getting closer to thousands. But in your opinion, when should people start seeking out mentors and should they limit themselves to just one at a time or can they have multiple mentors at a given moment? I don't think there's any right or wrong answer to this question, but I have an opinion. In fact, I'm writing a new book called 
The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship, coming out in June by HarperCollins. And I think oftentimes, Kevin, we define mentorship too narrowly. Mm. We think that, well, you know, to have a mentor, you need to be working in a company and your company puts you into their mentorship program and they match you with someone from the C-suite on the 12th floor and you meet once a month and it's all very formal. Well, hogwash. I mean, that's a great process. And if your company provides that to you, take full advantage of it, whether you are a mentee or a mentor. But for a moment here, let me redefine a couple of conventional wisdoms around mentoring. One is, I think when we think of mentoring, we say, okay, I'm going to go to barber school. I want to be mentored by a barber. So who's the most successful barber in town? Let me tell you, if I'm looking for a mentor to mentor me on how to have a great marriage, I don't go to the guy that's had a 50-year marriage. I go to the guy that's had five marriages because I can't replicate all the genius and wisdom you've had in your 50-year marriage. I'm not you. I don't have your patience. I don't have your thoughtfulness and your wisdom. I go to the guy that's had five marriages to teach me what not to do. What are the things you did wrong that I'm being a bit exaggerated. I hope he hasn't had five marriages, but you get the point. I think half of success in life is learning how to walk around the metaphorical potholes. Just don't do this and don't say that. If I want to have a successful business, I don't go to the guy or the gal that's had a multi-million dollar business. I go to the guy or the gal that's had three bankruptcies. What did you do wrong? What can I learn from that? Because I can avoid the mistakes you made, I can't replicate the successes you had in most times. Now, the other part about mentor, so that is to say, if you want to be mentored by someone, don't just look for the most successful person. Also take in mind the person who might have had the most attempts at it and had the biggest failures because there's going to be a lot of lessons to learn from them. Now, secondly, I would also redefine the role of mentorship. I'll tell you, I think that most of the mentors in my life don't even know I exist. They were the host of a podcast, the host of a radio program. They were an author that I went to conferences just to watch their keynote speeches. And so I don't think the mentor in your life has to be a formal recognized role where you say, well, you mentor me and they say yes. And you say six sessions, they say five sessions and whatever that is. That's great. Absolutely do that. And redefine and broaden your role, what it means to have a mentor. It might be someone that you follow on social media and you like their confidence or you like their character or you like their courage and you want to model that in your life. And to answer your question, I don't think it's ever too too young to have a mentor. I mean, maybe if you're in elementary school, you probably have some mentors you don't know. They're probably parents and grandparents and older siblings. But let's redefine the role of mentorship while my dog goes crazy because he's a puppy and I can't stop him from barking. So I apologize. (laughs) Not not a problem. But but it sounds to me that the first part, you, you we tend to learn as much, if not more, through experiencing somebody's failures as opposed to watching their successes. Because like you said, we now we learn what not to do. And I forgot who who it was who said it, but um it was or is it it's an old saying that It doesn't make sense to it's okay to fail and make mistakes as long as you don't make the same mistake twice. And I think by watching somebody else's mistakes, then we learn what not to do. So we don't make that same mistake twice, because what the old saying says was that we're we're doomed to repeat history unless we learn from it. Right. So we have to learn from what other people are doing or not doing correctly so that we can not fall into those same potholes and and take a, a, a shorter route to getting to the success that we're looking for. Hey, beautifully said. And I can reassure your viewers or listeners, I've made lots of the same mistake twice. I think (laughs) we all have. But (laughs) I've made many of the same mistakes twice in the same day. It's called bread. (laughs) It's called champagne. (laughs) It's called friendships, right? (laughs) Exactly. I think we've all, we've all done that. We haven't learned from our own mistakes, but, but I think it's, it goes to show that it is something that, um, there's something to be said for learning oh, from the mistakes yeah. and, the, and whatnot. I, I think that's the key lesson I wanted to impart is, is most of us cannot replicate the genius of others, and nor should we try. But most of us can learn massive amounts from the mistakes that these successful or unsuccessful people made because I think half of success in life is just avoiding the mistakes. You are listening to Instruction Discussion on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. My name is Kevin Boston Hill, and our guest today is best-selling author, host of the world's largest weekly leadership podcast, On Leadership with Scott Miller, 
and Frankly Covey Senior Advisor on Thought Leadership, Mr. Scott Jeffrey Miller. Let me ask you now, in, because we know in this world of, since we've been talking about students and young people, in this world of Instagram and TikTok, where everybody wants to be this million dollar influencer and look like this overnight success, talk to us a little bit about your interview with uh, Tiffany Alish, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Alice. 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 Exactly Alice. Right. Tiffany yeah. Alice. Yeah. And the yeah. difference that she talks about being between being an overnight fame and having and having o- overnight success. I'm delighted you chose to focus in on her. 30 mentors. Tiffany Alice is uh, a black American female. She's become a very famous voice in financial literacy, personal finance, aimed primarily at uh, an urban market, um, a minority market. Uh, she's known as the budget Nista. Yes. Uh, she has a, a very famous book out called get good with money. And, a, I believe a podcast and a blog and a newsletter. And what's interesting is I saw Tiffany Liche's book in the Barnes Noble bookstore. It's why I chose to have her on the podcast. I had not heard of her before, but what I didn't realize is that Tiffany had been toiling for a decade plus on building her brand every week week in and week out, producing a podcast and a blog and a newsletter and writing columns. And by the time it was it was ready for Tiffany to publish her book, she made this book a bestseller ethically by calling upon the tens of thousands of subscribers she had built to this weekly newsletter Mm. that she'd been creating for a decade. My point in sharing that is, and you kind of said it in the introduction here, is there is no such thing as overnight success. There is overnight fame. And that's usually Mm ill-gotten and fleeting. But there is no such thing as overnight success. You look at all of these celebrities, all these business titans that I've interviewed, whether it's Matthew McConaughey, Robin Sharma, Deepak Chopra, Ariana Huffington, Ursula Burns, John Maxwell, Seth Godin. These are names that your listeners probably recognize. These people have things in common. You don't know how many books they wrote that were never published. You Mm -hmm. don't know how many sitcoms or or uh, television programs or movie roles that Matthew McConaughey did not get or no one noticed over and over and over of trying and failing and trying and failing. You look at all these people that I've interviewed, these big celebrities and business titans, you see the big pop. You don't see the 80 or 90 attempts of pitching things and of things not taking off, right? I mean, my quite frankly, the podcast that I host now, the world's largest podcast in leadership, you know, goes to about 6 million people each week. No one remembers the first 200 episodes I taped every week, week in, week out, shaved in a, in a, in a suit or on camera, all through the pandemic, went into the studio twice a week, every week while people are sheltering in place. And I'm in there reading the books and going in. No one knows that. But, you know, around week 220, it begins to pop and explode. And mm. my point to wrap up your insight is what all the people have in common is they put in decades and decades of work and maybe like their 10th book, maybe their ninth sitcom, maybe their fourth movie, maybe their fifth business. You'd be surprised how many people wrote these massive books that sold millions of copies and no one knows about their first five or six books. They wrote them, they published them, they went and did book tours, they did press, they did podcasts. So as you're looking to build your influence, your business, your skills, your brand, just like everybody else, it's not going to come overnight. Right. It, it takes, like you said, it takes time. Everybody wants to be this overnight sensation. And like you said, they only see people, the the end product. They don't know the road that it took to get there and the, the literally the years of, of effort that it took to get there. I think it was, maybe it was Seth Godin or I forgot exactly who wrote it in their book, but it, it takes, what, 10,000 hours you have to put in yes, in order yeah. to be successful. Yeah, Malcolm, Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell. Right. Malcolm Gladwell, right. He popularized the idea, but it was really a man named Jeff Colvin, the former editor of Fortune magazine, that sort of codified the idea. Yeah, I think it's I think it's increasingly being debunked scientifically, but I think it's a great model to say Mm -hmm. if you want to become an expert in your field, you probably need plus or minus 10,000 hours of reps. Go get them. Exactly, exactly. So since we're we're still talking about uh, technology in in a degree here, um, I noticed you had you had uh, also interviewed Erica Dewan, and I'm probably mispronouncing her name as well. Oh, you you nailed it! Excellent job, Erica Dewan. And awesome. because she kind of focuses on, I guess, this new way that we are doing business now, because 
there's not a whole lot that takes place in person anymore. We're doing like we, we, well, we do interviews on on Zoom and other uh, virtual platforms. So what are some of the, I guess, the tips that she can get or she has provided to help us in that platform when we're meeting virtually? So Erica Dewan wrote a phenomenal book, came out about a year and a half ago, called Digital Body Language. Strongly advise all of your listeners to pick it up. She's also one of the most in-demand keynote speakers in the world, an Indian American um, uh, uh, expert on a lot of things, relationships, communication, and digital body language. And in essence, in a nutshell, she says, you know, your digital presence is now your new handshake. Hmm. How you show up on Zoom, how you show up on Teams, your lighting, your camera angle, your microphone, your agenda, your co- your ability to connect with the audience, your ability to have eye contact, your ability to modulate your rate, your tone, your, tone, your pitch. And so I really encourage your listeners to read her book. It's, it is the best book in the space called Digital Body Language. But it's very true, whether we're still working in a hybrid world or we're back to work or you're working you know, virtually at home or some model, all of us are going to continue to be on these virtual platforms forever. These aren't going away. They're just going to take on a different mix. Rule number one, always put your dog in a different room before you, you air our radio <laughs> podcast program. He, he's a puppy. He's insolent. He does whatever he wants. Exactly. It's hard to contain him. I apologize. I think you'll learn a lot from reading her book to make sure that you're thoughtfully thinking, how do I want to show up today? How do I want to show up? Right? You probably should be on camera. You probably need a, a, a better camera. Should you blur your background? Do you need a fake background or should you just tidy up your bookcase? I mean, lots of things to consider that really help to build your brand. And that's her key point. Exactly. You have a brand online. Create it, create it deliberately. Exactly. Because even if we were in person, you would be taking all those steps when you meet with people. You would. Anyway. You so. would. That's right. You would not be saying, well, today is a bad hair day. I can't come on camera. But how did you manage to get into the office for the last 10 years <laughs> with your clothes on and your hair done, but you can't now? You're taking too much liberties. Now, there is some fatigue about being on camera all time, all the right. And when is the last time you've had a phone call? I haven't had a phone call in two years, right? Everything is on camera now. Exactly. So I get that it can be fatiguing. But to your point, your digital presence is your brand. Make sure you create it deliberately. I noticed since we're talking a little bit about communication, I noticed there was also a chapter on, and incidentally, all the chapters are only, what, like three to five pages long. So yeah, they're, really, they're short. It's really quick yeah, read. read them in 10, 10 minutes. Yeah, it's really a quick read. But I noticed you had the chapter on Julian Treasure, and I love Julian Treasure. I actually go to him because I, I teach a couple of communication and public speaking courses. And so I, I kind of go to his expertise sometimes to help me out with a couple of uh, things that I'm, I'm teaching. What were some of the insights that we can glean from his idea of listening to the listening? Well, it's kind of an awkward phrase, but he's a Brit, so we'll (laughs) forgive him. So Julian Treasure, as you know, is an icon in the world of communication and listening. He wrote several books, including one called How to Be Heard. By the way, to your listeners, I would say go to TED and watch his TED Talks. They're remarkable. I think he's got like 100 million views across all of his TED Talks, but Here is the big insight that I shared in the book. If you want to be an effective communicator, you have to, in fact, listen to the listening. Listen to how the people in your audience are listening. You've got some people that are introverts and some that are extroverts. You have some that are visual listeners, meaning like they have to see it to be able to process it. Mm -hmm. And some that resonate with my kind of delivery, which is fast and loud and dominant, and others that, quite frankly, I repel some people because I fatigue them. So to be a, an effective communicator, you've got to deliberately pause, change your inflection, change your tone, your rate, your pitch, your volume, like I'm doing right mm-hmm. now for the first time in this 30 minutes. Some of your listeners are actually liking me more because I've slowed down my pacing and I've lowered my voice. Because my natural voice and energy level is up here. This is how I talk all day long in front of 7,000 people or sitting in the car with my wife two feet from me. It can be annoying. So my point in demonstrating that is Julian Treasure's work is priceless around if you want to increase your influence and your effective communication skills, get attuned to how the people in the audience are listening, whether there's one or two or 10 or a 1,000. 
Now, of course, each of the I guess little vignettes or, or chapters of the book ends with some type of transformational insight. I want to know I guess, how did you come up with each of the individual insights, even though you admit that, especially in I think that with the chapter with uh, with Ed Milet, you, yes. you you admit that each person or each reader is going to probably take something a little bit different away yes. from the vignette. So how did you yes. decide to settle on a transformational insight for each of those those stories? Well, speaking of Ed Milet, if you're listening, that, that was a very hilarious story, by the way. Oh, but. my gosh, it's hysterical. I mean, listen to the podcast yeah. interview with Ed Milet. It is riotous. Um, you know, it's interesting, Kevin, most authors are taught by their agents, by their editors, by their publicists, by their class to write for their reader, right? Like, what is the pain to be solved? What is their pain point? And I'll be honest, I don't write for my reader. I write for me, meaning I write for things that I find interesting, things that I find transformative. And at some point out there, there's going to be enough people who are like me that say, you know what, he's annoying, but I'm kind of like him, so I might read his stuff. So to your point, I tend to write what I think is transformational, and I wrote questions that I think I should answer. I mean, now that I'm in the public eye and I've had a successful career, I've also had a lot of setbacks and challenges, and not all my projects are successful. I'm by no way a master at all of these mentors' insights. So I usually will sit back and think, what's the big idea and what should someone take away from this? Like, what's a piercing question that I could ask to really make the reader or the listener, if it's an audio book, think about this more profoundly than just kind of moving on? And then some of these, of course, are open to interpretation. So like you read the story, you figure out how it relates in your life because you are, are in different roles. Perhaps you're just divorced. Maybe you've just suffered the loss of a loved one. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe you've just, you know, been promoted. Maybe you've just gotten married or you're a new parent or you're now single or something. Everyone's in a different role in their life. So I tried to write the transformational insight in the questions in a way that as many people as possible could learn from it. But like I said, at the end of the day, I wrote it probably from what I needed to read. I recently heard Adam Grant, the famous um organizational psychologist and Wharton School professor say on CBS uh, Morning, most of the advice we give others is the advice we need ourselves. And and I think we're going to end right there. And that was some great advice we have. But we would definitely like to thank our guest today, best-selling author, host of the world's largest weekly leadership podcast, and Franklin Covey Senior Advisor on Thought Leadership, Scott Jeffrey Miller. Thank you for coming on our show today. My honor. My name is Kevin Boston Hill, and thank you all for listening to Instruction Discussion right here on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.